the modification that you use is obviously important, but there's a lot of other parameters that are important when you're starting to ramp back into squatting and deadlifting, right? Uh, generally speaking, the biggest one to think about is going to be load, okay? So you have someone who has a cranky lower back. They might not be able to tolerate 90% of the one rep max, but they might be able to tolerate 70% of their one rep max really, really well, okay? So generally speaking, when we introduce deadlifting and squatting for someone that had low back pain in the past, and we're trying to be safe about the progression back, we start with lower loads and work our way to higher loads. Now, what might that look like from a programming perspective? So oftentimes I'm starting off my athletes with a tempo. What does that mean? So maybe that's two or three seconds on the way down, a pause in the bottom, two or three seconds on the way back up again with a pause at the top. Okay. Now, what does adding a tempo do? Well, for one, there is a ton of time under tension. So your sets just last a long time, right? There's a big metabolic effect, right? So your muscles will start burning, right? You definitely feel like you're working hard. It's just that you can't use that much load because you're moving slowly, okay? Most folks with low back pain are load intolerant. We can still get a decent training effect without irritating the spine by keeping the loads a little lower, adding a big tempo, right? And not aggravating the back. And over the course of time, the tempo becomes a little bit faster. So we start with slow speeds and we work to faster speeds, okay? The other thing that's really easy to change is going to be your rep range. So if you're doing really high reps, you can use less weight. But if you're approaching failure, you're still going to have a similar change in hypertrophy as doing heavier, heavier weights, okay? Maybe the strength gains are not quite as good as doing lower reps, but it doesn't matter because your back can't tolerate it anyway. So we keep the reps kind of high at a tempo in the beginning. And over the course of time, we reduce the reps and we increase the speed, okay? The other thing I like to manipulate a lot for my athletes returning to squats and deadlifts is called a rating of perceived exertion, RPE, or RIR, which is reps in reserve, okay? So let's say you finish a set of 10, okay? That set could have been pretty easy or could have been really, really hard. A 10 out of 10 set is basically you're pushing as hard as you possibly can, all right? Let's say you're, I don't know, your mom is stuck underneath a, a car and you need to deadlift that car up in order to get your mom out of there. And normally you couldn't lift that car, but you're just amped up with a ton of adrenaline. You're lifting that car. That's a 10 out of 10 effort. Okay. You're lifting as much weight as you possibly can. Your eyeballs are about to blow out of your head, right? <clears throat> Let's say you go in under the bar and it's moderate challenge. You finish up your 10 reps, right? And you feel like you had, could have done another five or so more. Maybe that's an RP of about five. Okay. So I generally have my athletes start in an RPE of around six to seven out of 10. Usually that means you're leaving, let's say, three to four reps in the tank. And every two to four weeks, I just increase that RPE or reduce the reps in reserve so it gets more and more challenging over the course of time, okay? Now, I think folks get into hot water in general if they do too much work that's close to their max all the time. So we're going to talk about this in a minute, but generally speaking, I think for most of the year... <clears throat> Athletes should probably not be pushing the envelope with the heaviest weights they possibly can. Now, do you need to push the envelopes in order to PR? Of course you do. It's just that we have plenty of research to show that in order to build strength over the course of time, you don't have to go to absolute failure. So that's another educational point to tell your athletes, because if they really want to push hard, they're probably going to be going to failure because there's a thought process. The harder you push, the better you get. And to an extent, that's real. But we do have research to show that you don't always have to push to absolute failure to improve. And oftentimes, if you're just pushing to failure all the time, you're increasing your risk of injury. Okay, so good age educational point for your patients. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. If you enjoyed this video so far, I have an entire course. It's free. It's called the Fitness Pain-Free Mini Course. And we go over three lessons going to help you take a lot of this information that we went over so far and put it into practice. The first lecture is called Why We Need a Better System. So first and foremost, the way we treat fitness individuals, all right, athletic people in the gym from a physical therapy perspective is pretty much broke, okay? So we need a better system to serve the folks that are in the gym, that get hurt, they want to get back to training, all right? Lecture number two is called Seven Reasons Why People Get Hurt in the Gym. And essentially, we have to know the reasons why people get hurt in the gym so we can keep them safe in the future, right? And when they get hurt, we have to know why and how to get them back to training in the gym. Okay. So a thorough understanding of this is very, very important. I actually have a really cool infographic that goes along with this lecture that you get for free as well. 
And lastly, we go over a case study of how to get someone out of pain and back to training. So these principles are all phenomenal, but we don't actually put it together and you don't understand how to create a program to get people back in the gym and keep them safe for the long term, then we lose, right? So I'll put a link in the show notes for this. It's a fitness pain-free mini course. Definitely check this out.